Hello, everyone. I see we've got many people still joining, so I'll give people just a, a minute to uh, get into the room with us. Those numbers are still climbing. All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Leading Questions. I'm Julie Novkov, and I'm the Interim Dean of the Rockefeller College of Public Affairs and Policy. Rockefeller is very pleased to be a sponsor for tonight's conversation with the Capital Region Mayors. Joining me this evening is UAlbany President Javidan Rodriguez, who will be interviewing our mayors. Good evening, President Rodriguez. Good evening, Dean Novkov. Good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining us. And I would also like to welcome you, Albany Student Association President Abdullah Gujabi, who will be introducing our wonderful guests. Thank you, Dean Novkov and President Rodriguez. On behalf of the Student Association, I'm delighted to welcome to you, Albany, the mayors of Albany, Schenectady, and Troy, to share their insights on leadership and experiences as public service, political candidates, and tested managers. Kathy Sheehan is in her second term as Albany's 75th mayor. Mayor Sheehan has dedicated her administration to creating a city of opportunity, leading with a commitment to equity and responsive government that includes diverse community voices. Mayor Sheehan served a four-year term as Albany's treasurer prior to being elected mayor, implementing changes to improve the city's fiscal policies and overhauling the city's parking ticket system. Before serving in elected office, she was the vice president general counsel and corporate secretary of a publicly traded medical device manufacturer. Gary McCarthy has served as mayor of Schenectady since April 2011, bringing with him more than three decades of experience in government and a reputation as a hands-on accessible public servant who believes that government can be a force for positive change in the life of his residents. He was elected to a full four-year term as mayor in November 2011 and was re-elected in 2015 and in 2019. Mayor McCarthy co-chaired the Center for Economic Growth's Capital Region Local Government Council and previously served as president of the New York State Conference of Mayors. Patrick Madden was re-elected as mayor of the city of Troy on November 5th, 2019, running on a campaign dedicated to upgrading the city's infrastructure, investing in Troy neighborhoods, increasing economic growth, and delivering balanced budgets to protect taxpayers. Previously, Mayor Madden served for 30 years as executive director of the Troy Rehabilitation and Improvement Program, also known as TRIP, a community development corporation with a strong commitment to providing a path to home ownership through financial management counseling and educational programming, helping thousands of families purchase their first home. Please welcome Mayor Sheehan, McCarthy, and Madden. Thank you so much, Abdullah. And welcome to our mayors. We're so glad to have you with us. Glad to be here. Thank you. Good evening. So before we're going to get started here, um, I would like to ask our audience to send your questions for the mayors through the Q&A function. Uh, you will be able to send them at any point during the program. Uh, you may certainly indicate your class year and program of study in your hometown with your question if you'd like. We will be moving to ask your questions a little bit later on in the program. And I also wanted to alert you that the audience chat will be disabled during our conversation. Mayors, we always start our leading questions with an audience poll to get a sense of where our students, faculty, and staff stand on a question that we'll be exploring with you. So tonight's poll question is, what is the most important job of a mayor? So audience members, please choose only one of these answers and we'll see what comes up. I know it's hard to pick just one, but you've got to commit to just one of them. All right. Oh, very interesting results here, folks. Uh, looks like um, a, a slight, uh, slight plurality here. We've got keeping the city safe and creating a livable city where people want to settle down, both at 26%. 
then being accessible and responsive to our city residents at 23%, narrowly followed by managing the finance. being a good cheering and ethical administration also picked up a few votes. Very, very interesting. I'm sure we'll be getting into that as we have this conversation. Uh, so I'm going to be stepping away for a short time to handle incoming questions from the audience while President Rodriguez chats with Mayor Sheehan McCarthy Madden. I'll be back in the second half of the program for our lightning round and our audience Q&A. So let's hear what everyone has to say. Thank you, uh, Dean Nafkov. We really appreciate your leadership and joining us uh, this evening. And welcome uh, to our three mayors, Mayor Sheehan, Mayor McCarthy, and Mayor Manton. It's always good to uh, see you all. And thank you so very much for joining us. We're grateful that you have taken the time to speak to us and to directly to our students regarding the, the rewards and the challenges uh, of a career in public service. And I'm really delighted that we have two mayors, McCarthy and Madden, uh, that are UAlbany alumni as well. So that, that is uh, really great. So thank you so very much uh, for being with us uh, this evening. And I know that our students will take with them some valuable uh, lessons and insights uh, as a consequence of our conversation tonight. So this will be really a conversation. We have roughly about 20 minutes uh, and I have four to five questions, depending on, on where we are. So I'm gonna uh, put out a question and you folks jump in as you will, but uh, please bear in mind that uh, uh, the time limits as well. But uh, first and foremost, I really wanna thank all three of you for your great leadership in your corresponding cities and everything that you do, uh, not only for the cities that you represent, but for the entire capital region and for the great state of New York. Your work and your service is greatly, greatly uh, appreciated. So let me start with the first question. What motivated you to be in charge of the safety and well being of an entire city? Who wants to jump in? Okay, I'm going to pick on you. Mayor Madden. Sure. Come on. Okay. Uh, you know, I suppose there's as many motivations as there are mayors. And uh, in my case, I'd probably say it was a sense of duty to the community that I had dedicated my career to. Um, as was noted for many years before I became mayor, I ran a community development corporation. And the city of Troy was gaining some momentum, but there were still significant structural problems. And uh, then about seven years ago, the sitting mayor decided not to run again. And I'll be blunt, I was mortified with the candidates who were jockeying for position. Um, I felt there was a lot at stake and I thought it was a pivotal time for the city. So I felt I couldn't sit back and watch. So I, I stepped forward and that was never anything that I thought I would do. I, um, I recognize that the skill set that I brought to the job may not be the skill set Troy needs in a mayor five years from now and it may not be the one that was needed 10 years ago. Uh, but it was the one that was needed at that time. And so it was very fortuitous that I could step forward. And um, I think it was just good timing for myself and for the city. Great. So Mayor Sheehan, what about you? Well, you know, for me, it was uh, a, a lot of discernment, uh, right? About why why would I want to do this? And, and, and what do I bring to the table, really? What is it that the city of Albany needed um, you know, and very similar to what Mayor Madden said, I think that I had a skill set that at that moment in time was a skill set that the city needed. I had been asked by a group of people to run for city treasurer, which in the city of Albany really fills the function of a controller. And I had initially declined that. And then when I really thought about it and realized that, um, you know, there were a lot of things that I wanted to see change in our city and I could continue to try to do that from the sidelines or I, I could actually put myself forward and be a candidate, um, I decided to run and I did run for that office and win. And then after being in that office, I really felt that I understood the city at a much deeper level. I don't know that I would have run for mayor had I not had that experience and that sense of um, understanding what the challenges were as well as having relationships with people within the workforce who I knew could help me uh, as, um, as the mayor to lead us through some of those challenges. Thank you. How about Mayor McCarthy? 
Uh, I had uh, run for mayor once and the uh, voters uh, declined to give me the opportunity to serve. I was on the city council and my full-time job was the uh, uh, chief investigator in the district attorney's office. And the city council president was happy in that role, enjoying it. And the mayor at the time uh, then took a job in the uh, governor's administration that created a vacancy. So I had uh, about two and a half, almost three weeks to go from uh, the part-time council president to being the uh, full-time mayor. Uh, it was uh, I felt prepared for it uh, because of my work in the DA's office, my time on the city council. I had uh, chaired the industrial development agency, had been a uh, member of the Metroplex development board. I'd been the county democratic chairman. So I had a broad base of community experience, uh, but came in in a very short period of time. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, I will uh, say that the record's been fairly good and I feel fortunate to have the opportunity to serve the people in uh, the role. Thank you. So as you as you think about, you know, your, your professional career in terms of being a mayor, uh, and, and this should be an interesting question, uh, what has surprised you the most about being a mayor? And I, I assume you have a very long list, but, you know, share a few things with us in terms, what are the major surprises that you've, uh, either when you were beginning throughout the, you know, throughout your time, or even now, what are some of the major surprises that you've encountered? So uh, for me, um, I was surprised by a number of things not having been in government. One of them was how political um, everybody is when you get into government. I, I found that very disconcerting. But uh, the, real, um, the real thing that surprised me was that when I became mayor, I became the other. I became the them in the us versus them paradigm. And um, it made clear to me how profoundly that we as a society have either lost or relinquished the sense that we're self-governed. Um, government is viewed as a separate and distinct entity. Um, and I think that's really unfortunate. And I think it, it has some very uh, long-term negative ramifications. We, I'm sure we could spend a whole night on that. And, and uh, I know we don't wanna do that right now, but I think it's an unfortunate evolution in our thinking. And I, while I recognized it on a national level, I didn't think it applied so forcefully at a local level, but it does. And so, you know, in my meetings, in my communications and uh, my messaging, I've tried to reinforce the notion that governing is really about coming together to accomplish things that we couldn't accomplish separately. And that government is just a tool of the people. It's not a separate entity. It's not a separate being. So I remain disillusioned by that sense in society. And uh, I, I frankly, I was quite surprised by that. Hmm. Yeah, I think actually building on what Mayor Madden just said, I, one of the things I, I thought about this, but one of the things that really did surprise me was the level of disenfranchisement that exists, the distrust that residents have for elected officials. And you know, you become that elected official to Mayor Madden's point, you then become that that other, you know, everything is viewed through a lens of, you know, why are they doing this? That can't possibly be because they think that they're 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 trying to help me. Um, but it it also is um, you know that that there are there are sort of the same few people who show up um, and who say that they speak for a much broader group of people. But as you get out into the community and really talk to people um, and, and and try to understand what their challenges and concerns and ideas are for improving their community and, and helping to bring change to their community, uh, you you get the sense that for so many years, they felt as if their voice didn't matter, that nobody listened, um, that things were promised and then not followed through on. And so for me, it's been, you know, now going into my ninth year of just being relentless in community outreach and engagement, being relentless in following through on what we say that we're going to do, because that is the only way that you move a community forward. You have to have people invested in it. Government can't do it alone. We can't possibly do it alone. 
And so, you know, if we want cleaner streets, we have to have people stop throwing garbage on the street. How do you invest people in that community and, and start to change the trajectory? There are some things government can do, but we can't do all of it. And that level of disenfranchisement, skepticism, cynicism is a real challenge for, I think, mayors like the three of us who really want to help move our communities forward. Yeah, good point. Gary? Uh, one thing that surprised me is the mayor is clearly an important community leader, but people perceive it to be almost all powerful. When you call the mayor's office, they expect the mayor to uh, call the governor up, to call the president, to solve uh, problems that are way beyond the scope uh, and influence of the mayor's position. But people look to it for that. Uh, element of uh, it, you're still one of the closest people to uh, local government or the local government that's closest to the people. But it's that perception of power that doesn't really exist in the position other than the bully pulpit, where again, when issues come up, the mayor's office can advocate for or against uh, an idea, concept or project that uh, hopefully can uh, drive a community in the right direction with the best outcomes. So there is really no associates or bachelor's or graduate degree to show you how to become a university president. I assume there's no equivalence either to show you how to become a mayor. So how do you become a mayor? I mean, what does it take? Gary, you want to start that one off? It's... Uh... You know, yeah, there's the campaign component of it. So you have to have uh, respect within the community uh, where people are going to vote for you. Uh, and you have to be able to articulate uh, a message that synchronizes with what the, those topics that are uh, uh, the hot points of that particular time. Uh, and you have to be able to put a team in place both in the campaign and then the day-to-day -day operations of the community. And that to really be effective, what I've learned and think my colleagues have too, is it's not only the team that reports to the mayor, but it's working with business leaders, uh, education leaders, uh, adjacent communities. You know, I think under your leadership at the university, it's just uh, been one of those partnerships that, uh, we've been very fortunate as Schenectady has benefited. We, we just got a national award uh, this month uh, because of our partnership with the uh, uh, Center for Technology and Government at the University of Albany. And it's those things that pay off and hopefully uh, create opportunities for whether you're a student, whether you're a business, whether you're a resident uh, to come in to uh, really have the full impact in uh, benefit that uh, you want to be able to drive within a community. What are, you, what are your thoughts, Kathy? Well, I, you know, I think that if you look at the backgrounds of the three of us, you see three very different pathways to becoming mayor. You know, Gary with his long-term public service and his deep understanding of particularly the criminal justice system um, in, in the work that he did uh, for, for Schenectady. Um, you know, Patrick really understanding, uh, you know, the power of community-based organizations, of organizing, of, of working within that not-for-profit world, which also includes having to have some business acumen, right? <laughs> um, you know, not-for-profits run on shoestrings often, but they have to run. Um, and, you know, my background, which was, uh, you know, I'm an, an attorney as, as a uh, uh, are my colleagues, but I'm I'm also uh, came from the private sector, uh, but was always very involved in the community. So you know, I think part of being successful in this role is realizing the parts of of the of your background and experience that you're not bringing to the job, mm -hmm. and and understanding um, you know what what you don't necessarily have expertise in, and then as as Gary said, you know, finding the talent and the team to be able to, to round that out is, is really critically important. Um, but one of the things that I say um, to, to students and to people who are interested in public service is that 
you know, the more you volunteer, the more you get to understand your community. I've always volunteered. When I was in uh, college, I, I volunteered at, at, for many different types of organizations, everything from, you know, campus cleanups to, to more substantive um, roles and opportunities. But, you know, that is really where you build those relationships where you meet people who are doing things that are important for your community. And it's going to be important for you to have their backing and their support in order to, to be able to put together a campaign and, and get elected. Absolutely. So Patrick, what are your thoughts on this question? I, uh, I don't have a whole lot more to add. I, I would say though that it's not the depth of education or experience in a particular field as much as it is the breadth of experience. Um, I, I have experience in a number of fields that I use every single day, law, insurance, real estate development and management, finance, engineering, community, organizing, construction, but I'm not an expert in any of them. And it, and it would probably be dangerous if I was because I'm not in a role to be the city's lawyer or the city's construction manager. Um, but I know enough in those fields to ask the right questions, to bring forth the experience out of the staff to solve the problem. So in my view, there's no experience uh, that you can get that won't be useful at some point as a mayor. So go for breadth, not depth. Great. So just following this theme here for a minute, let's say we want to develop a course at the University at Albany for those that want to be mayors, and we can develop a, a long syllabus of everything that needs to be included. But if you had to select one item, just one <laughs> topic, and they have to be different, for all three of you, one topic that definitely needs to be included in that syllabus. What would that be? Who wants to take the first stab at this? I'll jump well, in so that nobody else. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> since they have to come up with something else if I go first. Is right, exactly, saying? yes. Right. They all have That's the same right. answer. Um, look, I think one of the things that we've learned in the last two years is that effective crisis communication is critically important. And being able to communicate effectively while still inspiring people and recognizing that part of the job of the mayor is to give people hope, um, that, that that is a really important component uh, of what we do. Great. Patrick? Yeah. I, I think not too different than that is, is some some sort of psych course, and, and I'm not being facetious here, but you know we deal with a great many human interactions and, and face it, people aren't calling me or aren't coming down to my office to tell me how wonderful their life is or what, you know, how great their day is. They're coming in because they, they have some stressor in their life and they're looking for a solution. They're looking for help, um, for relief. And, and it could be a minor issue or a major issue, but Addressing human needs is a constant for us day in and day out. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that's evolving and becoming more and more critical, not if you want to be mayor, but in business, any leadership role is that of data management. There's so much information that is being generated today that you have to be able to reduce it down to a usable form and do practical applications from it. I think with those answers, I'll start writing the syllabus then, you know. Uh, I always get asked this question and I always answer, I can write a book on it, but we're not gonna write a book today because we're limited on time. But one, one answer to this question as well, what keeps you up at night? Kathy. Well, right now what keeps me up at night is the proliferation of guns in my community, illegal guns in my community. Um, uh, it, it, it is, um, you know, it, it is a complete failure of, uh, of our policymakers to be able to come together at a national level. It's a complete failure of our ability to not scream at each other and to have rational conversations about guns and Second Amendment rights and, and, and you know, common sense uh, gun controls. But what keeps me up at night is that there are just there, there are so many guns in our community in the hands of people, um, particularly young people, uh, and and that it, it is a is is a real challenge. Understood. 
Patrick? I think we all share that concern. Um, it's There's more guns than brains on the street right now. Um, and we're an angry society. We're an angry world right now. Um, and you can see that change over the past two or three years. One of the things that, that, worry me, uh, that worries me uh, related to that, uh, you know, is one of our police officers going to get shot going to a domestic incident? Is one of our firefighters going to get hurt um, going to a, to a fire scene? We put our employees in high risk situations and we provide a lot of training a lot of resources, a lot of equipment, but that's not a 100% guarantee. There's great danger in, in many of the services that we provide. Yeah. How about Gary? I'll be a little bit sarcastic and give you two answers. What keeps me up at night is my cell phone, because if you're mayor, the phone rings all night. Uh, but as my colleagues have pointed out, it's those areas of public safety that uh, you have to uh, deal with in your there's no shield between the mayor's office and some of the worst situations that are out within a community. So it is uh, tragic fires, it's death of people because of poor choices people are making with uh, guns or other drug overdoses. But that area of public safety is something that you have to be concerned with and have to be able to deal with every day. Certainly all critical issues that you know you have Major responsibilities uh, to 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 navigate along with your leadership teams. I already got my uh, five minute warning, so but I want to uh, let's see if we can conclude with this question. You know what is it that you are most proud of as the mayor of your corresponding city? What is it that you're most proud of? Uh, let's start with Gary this time. Again, I'm most proud of the economic development team that we have in Schenectady, not only the city of Schenectady, but the county and the renaissance that this community has gone through and is going through. Uh, and that only happened because of people working together and seeing the opportunity that was here and the partnerships that we have developed that are producing real long-term sustainable results for the city of Schenectady. Great, Kathy? You know, our workforce, I, I, I'm, I'm just so proud of all that they've been able to accomplish, the resiliency um, of the workforce. And I mean that across all departments. I mean, certainly, you know, Gary touched on um, the challenges and, and Patrick that our police officers face every day. They, they put their lives on the line and, and, um, and do so under really, really difficult circumstances. You know, the same with respect to our, our firefighters, but you know, it's our sanitation workers. It's, it's people who, um, you know, throughout a pandemic under grave uncertainty about their health as well as their financial futures um, have worked really, really hard uh, for our residents. And I'm, I'm very proud of them. All good, Patrick? Um, I, I, since day one, I've been laser focused on the city's finances. I don't think the um, audience understands the uh, financial difficulties we were under, but it was it was extremely uh, tenuous whether we would survive or go into bankruptcy. Um, I've retired a lot of old debt, um, increased the bond rating, and I don't. When I say I, I shouldn't say I. It's a, the team that I put together. It's the taxpayers. It's the community. And I dragged the council along kicking and screaming all the way. But um, you know, we've gotten our debt under control. And why is that important? It's important because um, next year, instead of paying bondholders, we'll be investing in ourselves. We'll be investing in, in the quality of life issues in the city of Troy, the things that we've neglected for the past 25 years because of bad financial decisions uh, many, many years ago. Um, I'm proud that we could get through that as a city. Um, I, I spent a lot of political capital doing that. Um, I'll never serve an elected office again because of some of the decisions that were made, but we did it, you know, and we created a city that's stronger and better for our children. That's great. So at the risk of my uh, screen being shut down by the IT folks in the background, can you all give me a, sort of your 10 minute, 10 minute, 10 second version of the role of higher education as you see it? 
we are in an institution of higher education. So let me start with Kathy, then Gary, then we'll finalize it with Patrick, and then I'll pass it on to Dean Nafkov. So Kathy. Providing the opportunity for uh, young people to develop critical thinking skills. It's, it's, it's you know, it, it is absolutely essential. Thank you, Gary. Education, people have to understand the importance of it and that it is not something that ends at any one point in time, it's ongoing. And so you have to take advantage of whether you're in high school, college, you're out in the workforce, learn something every day. Thank you, and Patrick. Ditto and ditto, and uh, it is a pathway for uh, people to um, achieve their life's dreams. It's a pathway to a job that pays a living wage. It's a pathway to home ownership, ownership in a community. Um, I'll leave it at that. Oh, thank you, folks. I, I really appreciate this engaging conversation. I needed another hour uh, with you three, mm -hmm. but we don't have another hour. So I'm going to pass it on to Dean Nafkov. Thank you so much, President Rodriguez. Uh, I'm sure all of my fellow deans would have loved to be here to hear that answer to that last question that you asked from all three of you. What a great conversation. I think we, we all have a lot more appreciation for the work that's involved in this critical position you all hold and just how important local politics is for our daily lives. Uh, I'd also like to thank Assembly Member Pat Fahey for joining our audience tonight. All right, mayors, I hope you are ready because it is time for the lightning round. I'm gonna ask you five simple questions and you're gonna give me the quick answers that just pop right into your head. So are you ready? Here we go. First question, what's your favorite pick-me-up snack from the City Hall vending machine? Chocolate. Roasted almonds. Terrible, I get potato chips. All right, um, I, I'm guilty as well. Uh, if you could be the mayor of any other city in the world other than those represented by your peers here tonight, which one would you pick? Mm, San Diego. New Orleans. <laughs> you guys have picked really hard cities. I don't know, I wanna find a really small city with really good beaches and, uh, you know, like cabanas that serve cocktails, whatever city that is. All right, uh, maybe we can send you to Cancun. <laughs> All right, third question. A mystery benefactor writes a check for $5 million. The only condition is that it must be used for a fun purpose that your city's residents will enjoy. How will you spend it? Grades in our parks. I think I'd renovate the, uh, we have a historic pool in uh, Prospect Park that's been closed for about 25 years. There's about five of them left in the country by this pool architect. I think I would uh, see how far it would go in restoring that. Yeah, I would uh, put it towards uh, the community center that everybody is asking for in, uh, in West Hill or the South End. Nice. All right, on a scale of one to 10, how tired are you at the end of an election campaign with one being ready to go out and run the Mohawk Hudson Marathon and 10 being completely exhausted? Wow. Physically I'm ready exhausted to run the marathon, marathon just to yeah. work off all the steam. Just, yeah, <laughs> physically a one, mentally a 10. Okay. All right. Last lightning round question. In one word, describe the typical day in the life of a city mayor. Glorious. Oh, you wanted the truth. It's, it's <laughs> unplanned. It's, it's yes, yes. Chaotic. Spectacular. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much. We're now going to open up the conversation to the questions from our audience. We're gonna do the, our best to get in as many of these that, as we can in the time that we have left. Um, audience members, I just wanted to point out to you that you can upvote questions in that Q&A section if there are ones that you would really love to see our wonderful guests answer. 
Um, the first question is going to be a kind of a combination of questions that we got in advance. Um, housing issues were very much on the mind of several of our audience members. So I'm trying to roll together uh, a series of questions that came in in advance, and I think I cover most of them. Have you managed to find effective policy solutions for the problem of affordable housing and fair access to housing in your communities? And what do you see as the most challenging obstacle in this policy area? Well, you know, I think as mayors, we don't really set um, the policies around affordable housing, but we, uh, to Gary's point, we advocate for it, right? And so, you know, we, we support developers who are looking to use low income tax credits to build housing in our communities. We try to identify partners who can redevelop um, properties and, and um, put them into productive use and, and create housing. Um, you know, we, we create policy around uh, the, um, the quality of housing in our communities is where an area where I think we have a lot more um, ability to, to really control that. And that's been a challenge in the city of Albany, you know, with substandard housing and the initiatives that we've undertaken to really tighten the rules around housing um, and, and create some really great safety nets for people who are living in substandard housing, um, putting more responsibility on the part of landlords and more costs on the part of landlords if they allow um, a substandard condition to, um, to last for any extended period of time. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, we really work with our state and federal partners around, you know, building affordable housing. And then, you know, I think we're, we're, for mayors, it, it's what are we doing to ensure that people are, are living in housing that is livable and not being subjected to, um, you know, slumlords, for lack of a better term, and, and substandard blighted housing conditions. Thank you. We've uh, started uh, probably just under a thousand units of affordable housing within the community without pushback. Before, if you were doing low income housing, there was always uh, community opposition. We've integrated it uh, smoothly with the uh, development that's happening within the community. But we all deal with the remnants of redlining from 75, 50 years ago that still affects communities in the, the distressed housing that every day drives up our costs for policing, code enforcement, and devalues the adjacent property. And we're all trying to uh, create that opportunity for people to move to the cities, invest in it, take pride in the property, and add real long-term sustainable value. Yeah, I think for cities, it's less about policy. We don't have things like exclusionary zoning, it's, and, but it's more about um, how do you muster the resources uh, so that you can eat, reach the income levels uh, that you need to reach. Um, and I'm not biased, even though I spent 30 years in housing in Troy, but I think we have a very good affordable housing network. Um, one of the challenges within affordable housing is for those individuals who need services, who need wraparound services, so that they can be successful in independent housing. Uh, that's an area where the resources have not kept up with uh, the uh, housing capital dollars. Um, but you know, I, over my tenure, I have seen improvement in that area. Um, and those are funds that typically come from state uh, resources or federal. Uh, so we do need attention focused there uh, on, on the state and federal level. Thank you so much for those very, very thoughtful answers. Uh, I've now got a couple of questions that have come in um, through private chat. Uh, one is about the most important ability that you would be looking for if you're considering job applicants and how do people go about getting jobs in city governments, particularly uh, those, uh, those of us out in the audience who might be new college graduates? Anybody has any ESRI experience don't listen to my colleagues, send your resume over to me tomorrow and they can start Monday. AlbanyNY.gov, we, we, we have all of our uh, job listings there and, and we are, uh, I believe we have uh, something like 200 plus positions open in the city. Um, but, you know, I think it really depends what you're, what you're interested in. You know, we're always looking for good project management skills 
Um, we, you know, are looking, you know, to, to Gary's point about data and data management and, and how do we interpret it and how do we make good decisions based on it. Um, you know, we have uh, positions at, at really all levels um, that are open and available. You know, we are a civil service environment, so I, I can't um, uh, stress enough how important it is to be mindful of that. Um, if you are applying for positions, most of the positions uh, in, in our city are tested positions. So it's being aware of, of how that civil service process works, um, taking tests um, and getting your name on a list. Um, but that said, you know, we're hiring people even if they aren't on a list at this point because we have so many positions that are open. We have some job openings. We don't have anywhere near uh, that amount, but also it's also listed on our website, troyny.gov. In terms of what I'm looking for in, in an employee, first and foremost, always has been, always will be values. You have to be in it for the right reason. Skills, we can teach you. you can, we can teach just about anything. But if you don't have the values, I can't teach you that. I want people there for the right reason because I uh, tend to give people a lot of um, uh, a lot of autonomy, and I need to trust that they're making decisions that are the right decisions, not decisions that are made based on, you know, what it means for their future in terms of an elected office or an appointment somewhere. Um, you got to be there to serve the citizens of Troy. All excellent insights. Okay, uh, from Juliet Humphreys, what are the current effect, efforts in the capital region uh, to try to lessen our environmental carbon footprint? Uh, are there any recommendations you have for our citizens and residents to be more eco-friendly? Drive less. We've, um, uh, we, we source about 50% of our electric needs now from um, uh, renewables from solar. In particular, we have a small and growing fleet of um, uh, electric vehicles. We're now looking at electric street sweepers. We've installed um, energy efficient lighting throughout all of our city facilities. We're in the process of um, installing LED street lights throughout the city. Some 5,000 street lights will be swapped out within a couple of months. Um, so we're, we're making efforts at both ends at, at reducing our usage. Um, and also shifting our usage to renewables. We have climate goals um, that we uh, have um, put out there with respect to uh, reducing our uh, carbon footprint. We're not going to be able to do that alone. Um, you know, we are going to need our residents to be to be part of that solution. So we're building the you know electrify electrification um, uh, infrastructure as we speak. Uh, we also uh, now have implemented a policy where um, for every contract that we put out, we have language in it around sustainability. So, you know, if you want to, um, uh, it, you know, it, it, as a city, for example, if, if, the, if our parking authority is going to build a new parking garage, um, you know, how is that parking garage going to be, um, you know, uh, you know, how is that going to be built in a way um, that, you know, it, it's uh, zero waste, zero energy. So, you know, what what investments do we, as we make investments going forward, um, we've, we've got to be really proactive about uh, what we're doing to reduce our carbon footprint. We're uh, doing uh, some of the similar things as Troy, some of the outlines that Albany has. Uh, I tell people it's something that you have to do every day. It's not just one item that the city is going to do or business is going to do. We have to change the mindset so that people are looking to do those incremental changes in their daily activity, whether it's just uh, doing the conversions to more efficient uh, appliances, uh, reducing the waste stream. That's the cumulative effect that we need as a society. And it's, it's not an easy step. Uh, it's very difficult to get everybody to buy into it because there are a lot of people that still do not understand the significance of climate change that we're going through. Thank you all uh, again. Um, Eric Lamb asks, in your time as mayors, uh, have the problems of the city evolved or changed? 
I have a guess as to how you're going to answer that piece of it. Uh, in other words, were the city issues when you first uh, connected or related uh, to the, your position, um, do they connect to the modern issues that you're seeing right now? And, and how have these issues you initially saw, saw been solved or have they shown progression or have they just kind of gotten pushed out by uh, other kinds of problems? My initial problems were more financial. We have a uh, much more stable fiscal position, so that allows us to approach other problems, hopefully in a more creative and results-oriented manner, so that we're able to invest in things going forward, as opposed to just worrying about paying the bills or keeping the lights on uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, I mean, when I became mayor, uh, we still paid everybody on paper timesheets and we had a, an IT system that had been purchased in 1999. <laughs> um, and so, you know, a lot of what we had to do and, and we were also structurally bankrupt. And so, um, you know, there was a lot of foundational work that had to be done um, because you can't build on sand. Um, and so, you know, laying that groundwork, making the investments, bringing in the expertise that we needed has given us the ability to now move forward with a lot of projects and a lot of opportunities that people wanted us to be able to address, but we really couldn't because we didn't have that solid foundation. And so, you know, in many ways, we're, we're getting to a lot of the fun stuff. Um, you know, notwithstanding uh, getting through COVID, but you know, we like like Mayor Madden, we paid off the debt on the expansion of our landfill that freed up millions of dollars for us to spend on our operations as opposed to on debt. Um, and so, you know, we're really starting to to get a lot of momentum behind some really long stalled and and much needed investment in our community. It, so, it sounds like we've all made it through some uh, difficult financial times that are now opening up new opportunities for us. And, and that is very exciting. I, I would say one thing that has changed that is not so exciting, though, is that I just have a sense, and I mentioned, I think I mentioned this earlier, but just people seem angrier um, than they ever have before. And it's not just, it's not unique to Troy or Troy all means connected. It's, it's a nationwide phenomenon. And it's, um, it is, um, uh, you know, it's discouraging um, to hear the talk. It's just, I don't even go on social media anymore. Um, but we see it from Washington right down to the local level. And, you know, I'm, I'm hoping it's a phase we're going through um, and that we will uh, at some point move through it. Um, but it doesn't show any signs of abating right now. Uh, and it's, it's pitting people against people. Um, and that is, um, it's tearing at the fabric of society. So um, hearing the three of you talk and hearing the, the interesting areas of intersection and overlap among your answers, I'm inspired to ask this question from, from Martha Aslin, who says, what are some examples of the major issues and challenges that require the three of you, uh, our mayors of Schenectady, Albany, and Troy, to work collaboratively or collectively on strengthening the capital region? I mean, we've worked collaboratively on the housing issue, um, you know, I think in really innovative and effective ways. We, we got together and sued a mortgage servicing company who was not up, up keeping properties in all three of our cities. And, you know, we were very effective in getting uh, those properties not only into code compliance, but getting some pretty significant um, settlement dollars that allow us to um, you know, do more work to ensure that we're addressing issues with blighted properties. And so, you know, that's one of the areas where we work together. We, you know, we're constantly working together on public safety issues. Um, you know, anytime there is an issue in the city of Albany, I'm often calling Mayor Madden or Mayor McCarthy, telling them what we're seeing, asking, you know, what they're seeing in their communities and advocating together for funding and programs to help to address those issues. Yeah, I, I, think there are... that I think the public doesn't necessarily realize the interaction that happens on a daily basis between the staffs of the respective communities. Mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, policing is one of those things that it's uh, almost hourly that there's some exchange of information or assistance that goes on. And then within planning, uh, some of our law departments, the uh, housing issues, there's really a very collaborative effort within the region. There, there are a lot of commonalities among our three cities where our cities are all roughly around the same age. Uh, housing stock is somewhat similar. Um, even the populations, a lot of people are interrelated between the cities as families move around. So um, it does provide a real opportunity for us to uh, collaborate both on a formal basis, as Mayor Sheen said, with a particular program and informally, uh, as Mayor McCarthy mentioned, between, our, between and among our departments. Um, and then when there are issues, uh, be it in the state or federal budget, uh, that are of interest to cities in our, of our age, of our uh, condition, then, then we do get together and we advocate uh, together to show a more forceful uh, voice in support of something. Great. Uh, Eric Zhang asks a question that I think picks up on what you've just said, Mary Madden. Uh, and also gets us back to this question about environmental sustainability. Is there a way to reduce our city's dependency on cars and encouraging people to use alternative forms of transportation? Is there a problem in the way that some streets are built more for cars than for pedestrians or bikes or other forms of transportation? And how do we solve that? So some years ago, we adopted a complete streets ordinance, which recognizes that streets are not solely for the providence of cars, but, but that uh, people walk on them or rollerblade on them or bike on them. We've, um, and I'm sure the other mayors have done the same. We've increased the number of uh, bike uh, laned streets in our community. We've um, um, connected um, where we can with walkways along the river for biking. Um, CDTA, Capital District Transportation Authority, has been, I think, a real leader in terms of promoting mass transit um, and um, uh, piloting electric, fully electric buses, which are pretty impressive. Um, so uh, there are there are things that that we've all, I think, engaged in to begin to shift the uh, the way streets. Uh, and transportation occurred back in the 50s when the, the automobile really boomed. Um, we're beginning to go back and recognize that there are other ways to get around. Um, and we see that, you know, as we open up walkable pathways along our river, uh, we see people walking to our farmer's market from other parts of the city that in years past would have driven down. Um, and it, I'm delighted to see that. And Uber and Lyft have helped as well. I think the uh, housing change that you're seeing in the respective communities, the, it's the investment in the urban area so that people are living in the downtown or living within the city and their ability to walk, bike, or minimize the reliance on the private automobile is shifting. And it's how do we encourage that trend that's been happening over you know, the last few years and we want to just continue it going forward. And I think that's where, um, you know, sometimes the, the leadership of the mayor is really important. Um, we had a pretty controversial um, uh, development that is happening across from St. Peter's Hospital. And it was a direct result of our planning. It is, it is an example, right, of, of um, building denser housing closest to our largest employers. So it's directly across from one of the largest employers in the city. It's on a bus line and bus rapid transit, which CDTA has introduced is really becoming a, a much more of a game changer among our cities with transportation. But there was pushback um, by people in the residential community surrounding it saying, oh no, don't do this. Um, it's gonna result in more cars, right? Because they're so car centric. But you know, we said, no, we're building we're building housing that is that will free people up from needing to get in a car to go to work. And so having to stand behind those principles and to fight for that, um, you know, it, actually in that situation, my, um, I hate to say this, but I have a brother-in-law who was 
one of the loudest people opposing this development. Um, but uh, you know, you have to you have to listen to the community, and and that's where again listening to the whole community, and then believing in the future of cities, the need to reduce the environmental impact that we're having. Um, you know, by having people get in cars and, and travel. And then, you know, it's also an example where, you know, Mayor Madden and Mayor McCarthy and I all wanted bike share programs. But if we mm -hmm. had each tried to do that on our own, we couldn't have possibly done it. We couldn't have afforded it. It wouldn't have made sense. So working with CDTA to, to um, implement that, we now have bike share all over the region. Um, the same thing with electric scooters. So the scooters are, are gonna be out and about this summer. They were piloted last year. They're gonna be out this year. Again, you know, very purposeful trips on those scooters to and from work, to stores, to farmer's markets that people um, are, are doing. And, and we're, we're able to do that because we do have that regional approach to these issues. And that's how we're gonna resolve these issues, I think ultimately in the end. Terrific, just so interesting. Um, uh, we have so many interesting questions that I, I have to leave on the table, unfortunately, because our time is growing short. But uh, before I hand you back to our president, I just want to thank you for this wonderful conversation. It's really been fascinating to hear these insights and to hear about the ways that you're collaborating with each other to make the space we all inhabit together so much better. But over to President Rodriguez. Thank you so much, Julie. Uh, so this evening we've been joined by uh, Mayor Kathy Sheehan of the city of Albany, Mayor Gary McCarthy of the city of Schenectady and Mayor Patrick Madden from the city of Troy. We've truly, truly enjoyed your conversation. And I would just like to give you each 30 seconds to a minute uh, just to provide some closing uh, remarks. Uh, let me start with Kathy. Well, thank you for this opportunity to to join you, um, you know, as as the host city for the University at Albany. Uh, you are so important uh, to you know the, both the Rockefeller College, the university, all, all that you do and that your students do for us. Um, it is really incredible, and it is greatly appreciated. And we want for your students to have a really impactful experience while they are at the university. And we also want them to stay. I'd like them to stay in the city of Albany, but I'd be happy to keep them in the region because there is so much opportunity here. When you think about all of the various employers that we have in the capital region, it's not just government, but government is a big part of it. Uh, and you can have a real impact. Uh, and you can also have a real impact, whether it be healthcare, uh, the private sector, all of the things that are happening um, with tech uh, across this region. And so I think that um, we're so grateful to be the host city for the university. We're grateful for your partnership. And I would encourage students to reach out, to seek internships, to get involved, because we want you to be part of this community for the long term. Thank you, Kathy. Gary? I, I also want to thank you for the opportunity to be part of this forum. Uh, the key, there's so many exciting things happening within the Capital District. Talk here for hours on it. But it's the element of workforce development, which Kathy alluded to, you know, that the University at Albany is such a key and integral part of, along with other institutions here, that people who are in the capital region are very fortunate. They tell people to make sure they take advantage of those things. And if what I said before is education doesn't end at any one point in time, it's an ongoing process. And try and learn something every day and there's just so many opportunities out here that end up making your life better and you can have the opportunity to make the communities better and stronger. Thank you, Gary. Patrick. Well, I'd like to add my thanks as well. I actually picked up a few ideas tonight, so it was very helpful to me. Um, you know, I know there are a lot of attendees tonight that are thinking of a career in public service and um, uh, being a mayor is, is, is a difficult, uh, position. In fact, it, it was uh, Lyndon, President Lyndon Johnson during the, the height of the Vietnam War protests um, when he said the burdens of the presidency, when the burdens of the presidency seem unusually heavy, I remind myself that things could be worse. I could be a mayor. Um, and, and I think all the mayors here would agree with that. It, it's, um, but I think we would also agree that 
you know, if we get to think about our lives on our deathbed, that this is one thing that we will be eternally grateful that we had the opportunity to do. Having an impact in your community, um, everything else pales in comparison to that. Hard things are worth doing. So if you're thinking of a career in public service, um, please, you know, please uh, consider, uh, consider what we've said tonight. And I would encourage it. Thank you. Thank you all once again for joining us today, uh, today, uh, tonight. I want to reiterate my appreciation for your uh, leadership, your ongoing commitment, and your very hard work day in and out, day out, 24-7 for everything that you do for your correspondent cities. I've had the privilege of interacting with each of you individually in meetings and events, and I truly, truly appreciate your leadership and the partnership of the University at Albany uh, with all of you and with your corresponding cities. So thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, this evening. I also wanna thank uh, Dean Julie Novkoff and the Rockefeller College uh, for their leadership and for hosting this event tonight. Uh, you folks always do a great job, Julie. You led a fantastic Q&A, so thank you so much. Uh, thanks to uh, our Student Association President, Abdullah Gudiabi, Gudiabi, I should say, and the Student Association. Again, thank you, Abdullah, for your leadership the Office of Government and Community Relations, the Office of Public Engagement, the Center for Leadership and Service, and you Albany's ITS FIU support staff. And to all our audience, thank you so very much for joining us this evening. And as always, please stay safe, stay healthy, and always stay engaged. Thank you very much, folks. We will see you later. Bye-bye, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye.